What's cracking guys? With this video I'm kicking off a brand new uh, video series on MLOps and during the video series I'll be leveraging four different courses. So let me quickly show you what those are. So the first one is, you can see here, Made with ML, uh, MLOps course by Goku Mohandas and we'll be focusing on a subset of the lectures here. He also has foundations course, which you can safely skip for the, uh, uh, in case you have uh, any, any background in machine learning. So if you went through Coursera, Andrew Yang's courses, you're golden and you can probably skip this because the focus of this course again is on MLOps, okay? Uh, I went through every single lecture here and I also went through the accompanied code, so I'm fairly familiar with the content of this course. The second course that we'll be leveraging is uh, the course that, that this diagram belongs to and that's the full stack deep learning course. So here you can see they have a, a set of very cool uh, videos and they also have a set of notebooks, Jupyter Colab notebooks that you can use uh, and that are accompanying those videos. So those, like every video has pretty much a corresponding notebook. Again, here I think we can save, safely skip these parts because they focus much more on the machine learning, uh, the modeling part, which, which is not the, the, the focus of this particular course. So like transformers and paragraphs, training a CNN on synthetic handwritten data, PyTorch lighting, deep neural networks in PyTorch. All of those are something that a classical ML engineer role uh, will basically encompass and the focus of this series is MLOps, uh, which I still have not yet defined, but bear with me. It's pretty much everything that those guys don't do. So like that's kind of maybe a, a soft definition. When you're building an ML powered product, there is a lot of components that go into it. And uh, if, you, if you imagine that that ML engineer role focuses on training models, then everything else that, that it takes to put that app into production can be in the broader sense of MLOps definition be considered uh, to be, well, yeah, the definition of MLOps. Uh, anyhow, I'm rambling. Um, let's continue here. So that's the second course. Again, I went through the whole course. I went through all of the video lectures. I went through all of the notebooks. So I'm fairly familiar with this course as well. The third course is the one from Coursera. This is a specialization. Um, it's called something like machine learning in production specialization. I skimmed through the first three um, uh, courses and I found them not that useful for what the focus of this uh, series will be about. So that means, so for example, in, in case you know you, you want to build your ML powered apps in uh, TensorFlow Extended or TFX for short, then um, by all means do, do go through the courses two and three because there's some useful stuff there about TFX. But uh, if you just want to focus on MLOps, the fourth course called uh, Deploying Machine Learning Models in Production is what the, the focus will be. And I went pr uh, through uh, all of these um, resources pretty much as I said, I, can, I kind of skimmed the first three courses, but like I'm, I'm fair, fairly familiar with what's going on. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable giving you these tips. Okay, uh, we'll see why all of these courses make sense. They are all complementary in, uh, in their own way. And I'm going to um, maybe, let, let me even do it right now. So this course by Coursera is going to focus much more on how do you basically um, uh, run inference on GPU, how do you uh, scale manually or using Kubernetes, how do you scale your, your, your prediction uh, backend uh, as opposed to these first two courses which are, uh, so, so for example, the made with ML almost doesn't have any uh, stress on this part. The full stack deep learning does it, but they, they use like AWS serverless. We'll get what it is in a second. And um, they use Gradio for the front end. So it's kind of, uh, there is a lot of, a lot of things to be, to be learned uh, in, this, in this particular uh, space. And the Coursera course, I think, did a complementary job to these two, for, to these courses here. The fourth course is the Machine Learning Systems Design from Stanford, uh, taught by, by the famous uh, Chip Wim. Uh, I, I, I skimmed through most of the notes and slides, enough for me to understand what's going on. I haven't read her book, uh, but I, I heard strong recommendations for designing machine learning systems. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the main point of this course, uh, why is it complementary? Because it's gonna give you theoretical foundations uh, about how, you, how you're supposed to think about these ML powered apps. So it's a bit more theoretical compared to all of the previous three ones I showed you. There is not that much code, but there are some cool uh, guest lectures, videos, uh, and again, the accompanied book, uh, which as I showed you here, is called Designing Machine Learning Systems, that's basically based off of uh, the, the notes of, the, of, the, of this Stanford course. Okay, 
And uh, as a part of this course, you'll have guest lectures by, for example, Hamel Hussein, who's going to uh, tell you more about how to think and pick the tools because you'll see it, you're, you're going to be very much overwhelmed uh, when it comes to picking tools for each of the components of your MLPART app. So, so there are cool videos like this one that kind of makes it, makes it easy for you to understand uh, how, to, how to go about this problem. Okay. Let's go back to the main diagram here and let me now properly define what I mean by MLOps. Okay, so here you can see this is an ML powered app. We have a lot of components. We have stuff like model training, uh, we have stuff like uh, experiment tracking, uh, model checkpointing, uh, basically we have model staging, we have model deployment into Docker container. If you're still not familiar with these terms, don't worry, we'll kind of introduce them slowly and gradually. And then uh, once you have that model, you want to put it onto some uh, basically uh, prediction backend and uh, that's going to run the inference when a request comes from the front end server, which is basically the component that's interfacing with the user, right? Uh, and finally, we want to have, so let me maybe quickly show you an example. I, in the previous video, I showed you my app here, uh, the Andrew Huberman transcripts. And so this is the front end. So this is like the UI, the, the, the thing you, you as a user interact with. And then when you type in a question, for example, uh, how much omega, three should I take or something? If you click enter, now the whole magic happens behind the scenes in the background. I, I actually already pre-computed some of the stuff so the machine learning is not running real time. Upon request, I'm using some something called batch inference and here come some results. And then here, here you can see the, the basically the, the app, uh, the front end uh, kicking in again. Okay, so that's kind of the, the front end part. And uh, now here you can see the, the, the monitoring part, uh, which is uh, about collecting user feedback and also tracking model behavior. So let me give you an example of what you want to track. So you want to obviously track stuff like uh, system metrics, like uh, what's your CPU load, what's your GPU load, how much RAM are you using? But you also want to track stuff that's very particular, peculiar to, to ML. And for example, you want to track whether there is a data drift going on. So let me give you an example to make this less, less abstract. So imagine you're training uh, like a classifier that's supposed to, to detect cats, like a cat or no cat. And you, for whatever reason, train uh, the model with cats that were taken only during the daytime. And now imagine your users start uh, uploading cats uh, that were caught during nighttime. All of, so that's gonna be an example for data drift. And you can imagine that your model is going to underperform on that novel data distribution. And ideally, if you have a very nice ML part app, you're going to automatically detect the drift and you're going to maybe potentially even trigger automatically the, the retraining procedure and then everything is gonna be automatic. The training is gonna be automatic. Once the model is, is, uh, is trained, you're going to do the um, evaluation automatically. Then you're going to push it to the container and everything is, is gonna be, be basically uh, pushed to deployment, to the, uh, sorry, to the backend automatically. So that's something called CICD. So you have continuous integration and deployment uh, set up on your, in your MLPART app. So all of those components uh, that I just mentioned and talked about uh, are something that I consider to be MLOps in a broad sense of that word. So except for the part with model training. So all of this here will be the focus of this particular video series. Now let's dig into a bit more details here. Um, there is a lot of stuff that you, if you are a data scientist, if you're a machine learning engineer or a software engineer, there is a lot of things you probably haven't seen in your in your career so far. For example, building front-end server. Uh, usually the, 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 the lingua franca of, of browsers is JavaScript. So that means uh, you'll probably implement your front-end in server in, 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 in JavaScript, but that doesn't have to be the case because recently we had a slew of new tools and servers being built in Python. Examples being stuff like Streamlit, stuff like uh, Fast API that helps you build your web servers in, in Python, et cetera, et cetera. But if you really want to scale this up to some huge, well, bigger scales, JavaScript is still gonna be that tool to use and not Python. So the first decision you'll have to make is pick between Python and JavaScript. Python, because you're familiar with the language, so it's gonna be a bit easier, but then you're gonna pay the technical debt a bit later, probably. Depends on, on what, what, how big you envision your application to be, right? The second decision you have to make here is, where do you want to deploy this, 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 this code, this server? So is it, is it going to be on your local machine and then you maybe forward the ports? 
that doesn't sound like a good idea, right? You're missing a couple of nines on that SLA, basically, like in case if you're running Windows and let's imagine uh, updates kick, kicks in, your server is down and a bunch of folks who are relying on your server are now pissed off, right? So you probably want to deploy that server on some, on some cloud. And now the decision of picking which cloud provider is a very important one because of the costs. Especially if you're a startup, you probably care about costs. And and for example, like clouds are notori notoriously famous for 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 being a huge source of costs for for new ML part uh, startups. So you might pick between AWS that has a very uh, rich ecosystem, but then again has a way bigger costs. Or you might pick some some of the newer clouds that are way smaller and maybe dedicated towards like focusing on ML, and they're going to be cheaper, but they won't have as a as powerful ecosystem as a AWS. So those are some of the things you have to know and understand and do your research on before you 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 you, you pick the right decision for you. Um, okay, then then the backend server. You do you want to build this again in Python? Do you want to build this in Node.js? Do you want to build this in Go? If you want to be really performant, how do you scale your backend server, right? Because imagine imagine if you have just a single machine and then all of a sudden you have a like a traffic spike. Um, those users. Like in case your your model your 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 backend is overloaded, the the request will be refused, and that's gonna lead to poor uh, user experience, and you don't want that, right? Because then they'll be pissed off, and they, the your app is gonna miss out on on that on the potential growth. So you want to think about scaling, and so when it comes to scaling, you have multiple options. So for example, the full stack deep learning course here is using something called AWS Lambdas, so the serverless backend. And again, serverless, one of those words that just kind of doesn't make any sense because obviously there are servers in the background. What serverless is referring to is the fact that the scaling is done for you automatically behind the scenes. So you don't see the servers. That's why it's serverless. But in practice, you might do something like Kubernetes where you'll have to manually uh, set up logic. How do you want to scale your backend? For example, imagine uh, you, you want to set up maybe at 60% of like CPU load, you want to kick in and add additional machine. In Kubernetes lingo, that will be adding new pods or adding new nodes. So there is a lot of knowledge to be had there. Like, and Kubernetes is also not the only tool that does this job. And so on and so forth. I could be talking about this a lot. Like there is for every single component here, you can make different decisions. So for experiment tracking, do you want to use weights and biases? Do you want to use some open source tool? Like I think MLflow is a popular one, etc., etc. How do you version your data? So you're used to versioning your code, but you also have to version your data. You want to version your models so that you can have well less errors in your system and reproducibility and, and robustness, right? There's going to be more components behind the scenes. So this is just a particular diagram for the particular app that was built during the full stack deep learning course in my own system behind the Huberman app. Uh, I also have databases. I have a NoSQL database uh, like called DynamoDB. That's something that Amazon offers. So you also have to pick, do you want to use SQL or do you want to use NoSQL? There is a lot of things and details you probably want to care about uh, building these apps and you might make mistakes initially, but that's what, what we are here for. Again. Do let me know which parts of, of this of this whole system you would prefer for me to cover in this series, and that's gonna definitely positively influence the, the outcome and the direction of this of this video series. Okay, now let's go uh, and focus on, on some uh, in a bit more detail on, on what each of these courses is covering. Again, this first part here, you can argue, uh, is basically uh, belonging to the to this segment of model training. So you can argue that labeling, exploration, pre-processing, splitting, augmentation, data augmentation are your classical data science ML engineer uh, types of tasks. Then you have baselines, evaluation, optimization. Okay, experiment tracking might be considered a bit more of a of a ML ops job. At least the folks who are building the tool are definitely doing the ML ops job. Um, then there's this first section, we can kind of ignore it, it just tells you um, more of if you're starting a startup, um, how you want to think about building your business. Like the product is, is basically about answering the questions, what? What are we supposed to build and why? Why are we building this? What, what, what need are we fulfilling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, engineering is answering the question, how? How do we do this? How do we implement? What decisions do we make along the way? Project is the part where you define who, so what's the team? hiring and stuff, and then when, what, what are the deadlines uh, for, for your project? So this is more, we're gonna skip and not focus on this part, but that's more if, you, if, you're, if you're starting your company, this is probably a useful uh, part to, to read as well. And then we, we come to these 
articles here. Packaging organization is again um, arguably something that most software engineers um, and, and uh, data scientists and ML engineers do as a part of their uh, role. Uh, so organization, what he's done here is basically he took the notebooks um, that data scientists mostly use and then took that code and packed those, organized those into files into your favorite ID of choice like VS Code for example. So those are some of, of, of in, in my in my opinion, something that belongs more to the classical roles, not to the MLOps roles. But again, de depends how you define. It's a very nebulous concept, and 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 yeah. Uh, in the logging section, uh, so you might think, so what's logging? Like, is it just like adding print statements? But it can be a bit more detailed. And depending again, do you want to build an enterprise level app or just a toy app? You might care about this section as well. So in this section, he shows how you can set up different types of loggings. And for example, your your if you if you type in like uh, logging dot debug, uh, then those statements are going to be printed out to the standard output, so to your terminal. But on the other hand, if you type something like logging info, uh, then that's going to be uh, basically um, stored inside of this file info log into some logs directory. And you can also see you can pick the formatters. I want to have a detailed one here. I want to have a minimal one here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can see here you can config your logging system in a way more robust way, and uh, and that's something you might care about. Okay, next up documentation. Uh, again, something that most of us don't don't think about. Hopefully, we are writing doc strings in case we are writing production code. And what the documentation uh, section here shows, Goku shows how to basically automatically using some tools extract the data from the doc strings and create automatically build your documentation page. Later, he's going to tie that and make that the whole process of building documentation automatic through this something called CI/CD, continuous integration and deployment. We'll get there a bit later. Styling is the first thing that that was like super useful for me for my project because um, um, there are some very good practices that that I was not using because it was a toy app and so stuff like using black black is the uh, the reformatter tool that that pretty much conforms to the pep8 standard the Python standard for how you're supposed to write what's the syntax of the code when you're writing in Python uh, I sort serves to uh, sort your imports and group them into categories like Okay, these imports are from the Python standard library. These imports are like third-party uh, uh, like packages, and then you have maybe local imports from your from your uh, repository. So that's what ISOR does. Placate again just double checks that your code conforms to the PEP8 standard, and you can also configure all of these tools. So that's kind of cool. And again, the best part about this course for me was that like the, the thing about MLOps is automation. That's that's kind of the the light motif. You want to take all of these tools and then just trigger them automatically either locally when you when you type in like git commit or on if you're if you're pushing to for example to github you want to trigger uh, through github actions you want to kind of run all of these tools and make sure that your code uh, is is tested is 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 formatted the way it's supposed to be etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's kind of very very powerful okay uh, next up we have make files those basically aid the automation i was i was mentioning and then in this serving section, he does a couple of things. In the command, command line um, uh, like lecture, he shows how you can take arbitrary functions from your, from your Python uh, project and turn them into, uh, using a simple uh, wrappers, you can turn them into command line functions. So you can later call them through the command line instead of having to run uh, through your ID. Next up, RESTful API. This is something most um, ML engineers are not familiar with this is how do you build how do you build the actual um, app how do you build the the backend prediction service so he's using a uh, uh, fast api uh, that's a python framework and let me show you just so this is by the way um, it's going to be a rest api which is just a fancy way of saying uh, this is this particular way of, of serving information where you post or, or you send a request to, to a server on a particular URL, and then you get back something like a JSON, uh, like a message like this here, and you have you have some data, you parse the data, et cetera, et cetera. So JSONs are kind of the, the language, the way that, that's, that, that web communicates, right? So for example, when you're, doing, when you're dealing with your ML models, the way uh, your models communicate is via tensor. So tensor in, tensor out. What what uh, what REST API does is basically you're going to somehow have to wrap that data and convert it into JSON and then send that via via internet. 
Uh, let me show you the, the, the diagram for the Fast API uh, app he's built here. Let me just find it. So here it is. So what you can do here, once you build this, this, this simple uh, web app, you, you'll be able to, to ping your model um, and, and ask, ask it to, to do some type of um, um, prediction. So for example, in this particular task, what, what, what he's doing is given some piece of text, he wants to classify whether that text is, has a tag that's like natural language processing or computer vision or, or RL or whatnot. And you can see here, you can post uh, uh, basically uh, a request to, to the server and back comes the JSON that I previously mentioned. So, so basically FastAPI builds this, this uh, dashboard automatically for you and you can, uh, you can immediately start playing with the API uh, locally. You still have to deploy this somewhere, uh, but Goku's course does not focus that much on, on, at least not in practice, he does give some tips on how to deploy this FastAPI app to some uh, remote cloud or something. Okay, then comes the testing part. Uh, most of us are familiar with testing code, but like when you're building ML powered apps, you also wanna test your data. He uses something called, uh, uh, I think, is it greater expectations or am I missing? Yeah, great expectations library. I haven't used it myself so far, uh, but it seems very cool. You wanna also test your models. Uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And there is a lot of cool details about how do you make sure that uh, that maybe heavy tests like training models are not automatically triggered. You want to maybe uh, mark some of those with uh, with different um, tags. For example, you want to have like the, the 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 heavy tasks called maybe I I don't know like training and then and then when you're testing using pytest you can you can do something like called pytest and then no training that's going to kick off all of the tests except for the ones labeled. Uh, marked with, with the training tag. Next comes Git. That's again something that's hopefully every single role uh, is already familiar with. That's a, your, your classic tool for, for, for versioning your code. Uh, then comes pre-commit. This is something that, that, that I was very happy to, to adapt after, after uh, learning about it. So basically it allows you to, let me, let me open it up. It allows you to, uh, after you commit the code, so locally when you, when you add some files into the staging area and then you hit git commit, uh, blah, 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 message, added pre-commit configs. So you can see we're gonna run automatically a bunch of tests and that's going to make sure that, uh, that, that, that the code is valid and healthy before we integrate it. So this is a part, in a way, this is a part of this whole continuous integration uh, workflow. The second one might be on the GitHub actions in case you're pushing to GitHub, maybe GitHub will, will, will itself run some additional tests and only then will the co code be uh, submitted into your repo and that's what's known as the continuous integration basically, in case you, you, you are not familiar with the concept. So you can see a, like a set of tests that you can do here, trim channeling white spaces, fix send of files, check YAML, check for added large files, check Python, ch check whether your, your Python file is actually a uh, legit Python uh, language and not, not some gibberish, check JSON, check for merge conflicts, whether you have some keys in your code, uh, whether, you, well, whether you've, you've accidentally added some, some keys there by mistake, uh, then run some of the styling uh, tools here, uh, et cetera, et cetera, around the tests, uh, maybe clean stuff in the sense of delete some, some uh, artifacts that were locally uh, built up during your model development phase. So you can see it's very, very powerful. And these are just some of the so-called hooks. There are many more pre-built and third-party hooks you can use with pre-commit. So it's a very, very powerful tool uh, that we'll certainly learn about in this, in this video series. That's one of the tools I know I want to cover because I was so excited to start using it myself. Uh, versioning uh, is a, a part about, uh, so Git is also versioning, but Git is for code uh, mostly. And then versioning is, so he, he uses DVC, something called DVC here to show you how to version your, your, your uh, data as well. Docker is for managing dependencies. So imagine you want to, you're developing a code uh, locally and basically you have a certain operating system, you have a certain set of de de dependencies, libraries, etc. And as they say, it's working on your machine. And then the next thing you know, you go to a different machine in the cloud, you do git clone, you try and run the code and something crashes. 
So Docker solves that issue. It makes sure that the um, basically environment you have locally is the same as the one you have remotely because it will literally pack everything from operating system to all of the dependencies. And so you know you will have the same environment both locally and remotely. And even though conceptually that sounds like a trivial problem, in practice it turns out to be a very, very important problem. And folks who have dealt with Docker will find uh, what I've just said very trivial and, and like obvious, but like I, I know that most of you have not ever played with Docker, including me until recently. I just didn't ever have to, to deal with Docker because working at big tech companies, you, you always have some internal mechanisms of how you sort some of these issues and, and, and those are usually abstracted away from you as a black box. In the dashboard lecture, he shows how you can build a simple a streamlit dashboard. And uh, let me see whether there is uh, some, some uh, visualization here. Um, yeah, it basically, it, it's just a, like a, a, a small front end. And again, he, he did not focus on how to deploy the front end, although he did he give some tips. But Streamlit is a very simple uh, way of creating beautiful dashboards in Python. So we prob will probably go through, th through Streamlit in this video series as well. I know that's, that's something I want to cover as well as pre-commit. Uh, CICD, hopefully I, I did explain uh, what it means by now. Uh, so he's going to use GitHub Actions here. So you can see here, you have your local code. You, you for example, um, you, do some, you do some commits on a, on a remote branch on GitHub and then you create a pull request and then you can set up the GitHub Actions so the CI system in such a way that before that pull request can be integrated, you run some tests, you deploy documentation and do whatever you want to do, some cleaning or, or whatnot. And only then can the code be submitted. So that's the CI part. The, the CD part is about once you have the, 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 the code submitted, maybe you want to kick off a training, get the model artifact, and then automatically push that to maybe some container on your server and thus automatically d deploy uh, the, the model to production. So that, that's what's considered as the continuous deployment. In, and obviously it doesn't have to be, and hopefully it's not to, to production. You can maybe first create like a, something called like a shadow, uh, like a uh, backend where the, the model is being served. But the, the, and, and so basically you're, you're taking in the traffic, but you're, you're not giving the predictions from the shadow model to your users, but you're still doing the inference just so you can compare the results from that shadow model with your produ production model. You can also do something called Canary where you basically turn, uh, you redirect a portion of your traffic either randomly or using some, uh, some information about the demographics of your user. You pass those to the Canary server, which basically maybe uh, takes only a, like a small percentage of the traffic and you're thus testing and seeing what, how it works before you push it to production potentially. Okay, so those are just some ideas. Uh, uh, do let me know whether this is useful because I know that for some of you this might be super obvious for others. It might be something they hear, hear for the first time. So please, please, any feedback, I would super appreciate this as I've never done uh, this type of content on my, on my channel so far. Okay, uh, monitoring, um, I mentioned this uh, before. So here we saw, we saw it, we want to test for data drifts, we want to test for concept drifts and other, other stuff. So yeah, I don't want to dig into much more detail there. Systems design, um, and this is something that, that, that Chips course um, basically covers in a greater depth. So the differences between um, like offline and online, do you want to do like uh, batch serving or you want to do real time serving? Uh, all of those details uh, are, are kind of covered uh, on, a, on a theoretical level in this particular uh, lecture. And finally, he has this set of lectures on, on data engineering, and this is more for enterprise level solutions. So if you're, if you're building a toy app, you don't care about this. If you're building a startup and you wanna scale it up, you probably care about this. So data stack covers stuff like concepts like data lakes, databases, data warehouses. This is confusing terminology um, until you just build something on your own and use a particular instance of each of these. So for example, data lake could be S3. In case you've ever used AWS S3, that's your data lake. So it's basically your, your object storage. You take an image, you take a video, you take a piece of text and you just store it there. And that's, that's kind of data lake. So you kind of push everything there without having to refine or transform your data. And that's like the cheapest storage. Then you have databases where you, you're, go you're going to be penalized if you have too much data because um, that's, that's how databases basically uh, price you. So you wanna probably put a reference to an object that's maybe stored in a data lake or something. And now databases can be like NoSQL or, 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 or SQL. And there is 
whole a whole lot of theory behind databases. I'm not gonna go there. I'm just kind of giving you some rough idea of what's going on here. Then there are data warehouses, something like maybe Google BigQuery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, those are uh, meant to be contain the transformed data that you can easily uh, query and get in insights from from that type of storage. Okay, so that's what this lecture covers, and then. He covers something called orchestration using the Airflow tool. There's a bunch of other tools. You can use Kubeflow uh, pipelines, etc., etc. The idea here is to, let me see whether there is a nice diagram here. Um, the idea here is how do you create, like usually ML, ML pipelines are very complex. So let's take the Huberman app I, I developed. I have to uh, check for the uploaded video, then I have to download the data. So that's maybe the first the first task and then I have to transcribe the data that's maybe the second test and then they have to process the data that's the third task and then I have to upload the data that's the fourth task etc etc and so you can do this either in your um, in your local Python file, which is what I've done in my project, or you can be a bit smarter and um, and, and 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 do it using some of these uh, tools such as Airflow. Now you shouldn't use those unless you have a particular reason to do that. Let me let me explain what I mean by that. Let me maybe show you something um, here. Let me open up um, VS Code here. And let me show you a simple example of how you would implement a pipeline in Python, okay? Uh, imagine you have functions one through four defined somewhere. So this is how you define function, uh, this is how you define um, basically the, the pipeline in, in, in Python. Here it is. And then maybe func one will have uh, some data that, that it will return and then you want to pass the data here and then we, we get some data from function two, like B, and we pass B to, to function three, and we get C, etc. You get the point. So most of us are used to doing this in a local file, and this is a pipeline, and, and you don't really, why would you ever need, like I was confused, why do you need this tool? Why, why do you need the Airflow? What does it solve? Now imagine the following thing. Imagine that function one maybe uh, tries and fetches terabytes of data from some data lake, right? So now that huge amount of data needs to be processed somehow on some different machine somewhere on the internet. And once it's processed, maybe you want to store it in a data warehouse, which is on some other place on the internet, etc., etc. So you can imagine if things are distributed in, in such a way, you probably want to use something uh, like that's enterprise grade, that's already built in and, and, and supports many of those cases and potential failures and errors that can occur with databases with, with processing all of that big data, etc. Etc. So um, you will know if you need if if you need to have Airflow or or Metaflow or any of those uh, enterprise grade um, tools in your project. Uh, if not, you probably don't need to care about about these lectures here orchestration. And finally, feature stores. Uh, again. Um, uh, for, 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 some purpose, for some projects, you will want to uh, pre-compute the features because pre -comp uh, like computing features on the fly is expensive and, and also because you want to reuse them uh, in multiple locations. And so, so like you just want to prevent the potential mistakes that, that you can introduce if you, if you do everything on the fly. Okay, I took Goku's uh, course just because it's very nicely laid out, but the point of this was just to show you the breadth of topics that, that uh, I might cover. And again, please, 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 do let me know down there in the comments uh, what do you want me to focus on. Okay, uh, quickly let me just go through the through the uh, notebooks here. So again, we can we'll probably uh, the the reason I recommended Goku's course as as a maybe a bit more beginner friendly is because some of these initial uh, notebooks are quite heavy and not beginner friendly. So let's take the transformers and paragraphs one. Let me show you what I mean when I say that. So let me just kind of zoom in a bit here. So let's go to section about RNNs or something. So why aren't we all using RNNs? Blah, blah, blah. One way of understanding capacity to model language is the Chomsky hierarchy. In this model of formal languages, Turing machines sit at the top, practically speaking. Um, with blah, blah, blah. You can see that it's very theoretical and then they start linking papers, which is something that, that most of you, uh, if you're following my channel, are comfortable with. But this course is also meant for folks who are not as comfortable with machine learning research as some of you are. So that's why I think that the Goku course is way more high level and, and approachable than, than, than this one. But I also think it's, this one is very complimentary, so you should check it out. When it comes to deployment, this course is way more powerful than Goku's, I think, because in the sense it's practical. They show you how you can set up a particular system using AWS serverless for backend and using Gradio for frontend to build an ML-powered app. 
it's a very very practical example of how of how you can go about it they also show how you can use something called locust to load test your backend to see just how much traffic it can handle and how the serverless is adapting so that's kind of cool let me try and find it so they have two repos here they have this repo called uh, let me just go back here uh, FSDL text recognizer 2022 and uh, as you can see here these the second repo is automatically created from this one they just have a script that basically um, cherry picks examples from this repo and transforms them into this one so like this already has all of the information you need and all of the notebooks as well but I probably recommend you to start with the labs one so the th this repo here having said that let me go and find the notebook I was looking for so let's see where they are notebooks and then let me find so load testing this is like a bonus not notebook that you will not see here on the on the on the in the readme of this second repo and what it does it does load testing with locust it basically shows you how your backend is capable how many requests it can it can handle and and all of those important details that you want to that you care about when you're building ml powered apps okay on to coursera uh, let me show you this one so why is it complementary? Well, because you can learn stuff like this. Auto-scaling TensorFlow model deployments with TF Serving and Kubernetes. So TF Serving is basically a web server, same as FastAPI, except that it's, it's meant for the ML workload. So it's gonna allow you to easily uh, do inference on GPUs. Uh, it has a lot of support for various ML specific thingies. And Kubernetes, uh, allows you to it's a very famous tool uh, it, it allows you to 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 have more control over scaling your your backend instead of just using serverless so that's why this this um, this course is complementary there is also things like uh, this um, uh, you can see this lecture here implementing canary releases of tensorflow model deployments with kubernetes and antos service mesh so this does what i already explained and that's how do you make sure that that you can um, uh, do canary testing where you just uh, reroute a portion of the traffic to your canary model for example in this in this particular um uh, lecture what they've done is they took ResNet 50 as the production model and they've took ResNet 101 as the Canary model just to make sure to see whether it's better whether it's performing better than ResNet 50 and then they they route maybe 3% and they they get uh, better results and then you can later integrate the the, the Canary uh, model into production by the way quick fun fact um, Canary is named after a Canary bird let me just see whether it tells it somewhere here. Minor canary, yeah. So they were used as sentinel species for use in detecting carbon monoxide in British coal mining for around 1896. Uh, so the idea is they can detect some of these dangerous gases that are that are a, a warning sign for potential explosion. And so when you have a canary server, what you're doing is you're putting your untested a new model that might explode onto that server testing where everything is fine before you push it to production if it passes the test then you can merge it into the production uh, deployment okay so um, that's why this 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 particular course makes sense it's very complementary to the first two courses uh, a big uh, important caveat here uh, uh, like it's 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 mostly useful if you if you care about tensorflow if you care about tensorflow extended tensorflow serving tensorflow uh, but even if you don't because the first two like the second and the third course focus on tensorflow extended uh, and here in the fourth course in the one I recommend, they're using TensorFlow Serving, but even if you don't care about TensorFlow per se, uh, you'll still learn a lot of important concepts that you can pick up and then later maybe implement stuff in, in TorchServe or, or in Ray or, or like whatever you want to use. Like I think uh, Nvidia has something called Triton Server, et cetera, et cetera, okay. And finally, Chips Courses for getting a solid understanding of the of the theory of how to think about these systems, about the trade-offs between uh, real-time like uh, serving online serving versus versus like batch serving uh, stuff like that. But uh, as I said, uh, disclaimer: I haven't read the book, uh, but I, I heard good recommendations, and it does look like a like a, a complementary set of ideas. Uh, as much as I could see here, uh, skimming through the slides, uh, notes, and watching some of the videos. Okay, guys, with that, I'm gonna wrap up this first video of the series. Um, for those of you who are still around, uh, thanks for watching the video. Um, do let me know if you have any feedback, and also, please, 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 uh, let me know what you want me to focus on from this particular uh, set of uh, components, 
and more particularly more specifically uh, from these set of lectures here what did you find interesting type it down in the comments I'm gonna make sure to reply to all of your questions and until next time bye bye Oh, oh, oh.